Who needs regulation wins when you can win an extra hockey? The Jets have done it in two straight games, maybe not against the top opponents. We'll dive into why the Jets struggled against the Arrows and the Coyotes on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. You're locked on the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Evening, friends, and welcome to tonight's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. Thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on all of your favorite podcasting platforms and YouTube. Doing so, of course, is always free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode. Most of all, though, we just love and appreciate your support. Tonight's episode is brought to you by Sleeper. Download the Sleeper app and be sure to use promo code Locked On NHL to get up to a $100, $100 match on your very first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details and locational availability. Now, like I said, tonight's episode, obviously, uh, Winnipeg just came off of a second straight overtime victory. This one against the Arrows and the Coyotes. Maybe not the most inspiring game, uh, although better than the the previous one on Friday against Chicago, right? That Chicago game was all kinds of messy for a lot of reasons. This game against the Oats, the Jets did better, uh, I, I would say, in a lot of areas. Um I would say lines two through four did their jobs pretty effectively, although we did see some really strange usage again from Rick Bonus, especially late in the game. We have got to figure out uh, what is going on with you know players like Perfetti and company really getting shafted, only playing like two shifts in all of the third period. That stuff just really can't happen. Uh, but aside from that, right, there's a much bigger problem with this team. And it's funny because you'll look at the score sheet and this particular problem accounted for most of Winnipeg's goals on the evening, whether it was on the power play or at even strength. But I'm talking about the top line and, you know, the top line we've we've talked about recently as kind of being a bit of a black hole, which is strange to say, because when you look at the, the box scores, like I said, they're accounting for quite a few points. But you all know that when we talk about a team's performance and how lines are doing and how players are doing, you've got to dig past that. I think this might be the first time in history where a line not only is performing poorly when you look at the underlying statistics, but also you're just visibly watching them and you can tell that they're not really gelling. Uh, This trio with Connor, Shifley, and Velarde just seems to spend like half of every game inside the defensive zone, and it's not getting better. Uh, Honestly, it's been really abysmal. They're rocking like a 35% expected goals percentage, which is one of the worst marks we've ever seen for a Jets line, much less a Jets top line. This is honestly worse than we saw with Wheeler uh, in this unit. So they are getting submarined. It's not really improving. Do I expect it to be this bad consistently? I I don't know. Uh, I think Connor might still be dealing with some lingering injury stuff. It's really hard to say, but you know, the vibes I'm getting with this trio, it's just not great. And even when their individual talent and stuff takes over, that's just kind of it, right? It's the individual talent rather than how this trio plays uh, on a more holistic sense, right? This this group just doesn't really seem to gel all that well. Defensively, they're a nightmare. Uh, they allow way too many, you know, second chance pucks and recoveries. They just don't seem to mark lanes and man mark effectively. There's a lot going on. And so, When they have those really flashy moments, I think people tend to, at least in some areas, overlook the other performance deficiencies, and they'll say, well, this trio hasn't played that much, give them time. But I think the truth is, we know that Shifley and Connor together don't work that well. It's been a long-standing issue, and it hasn't really mattered who you've played with them. You could put Ehlers with that duo, and you'd still have issues, especially on the defensive side of things. So none of that's new. What I would say is uh, particularly of concern, and Garrett Hole actually put out a really good article today that I would uh, highly encourage you to read. Uh, Be sure to find his link on Twitter. Um, But he talked about some of the specific components and stuff. And one thing that's kind of come up is how Kyle Connor is unfortunately very limited in what he brings to the table, right? When it comes to elite finishing talent and one-on-one matchups, there's really no question that Connor is one of the best and most elite players on the team at that specific thing, right? But if you start digging in under the surface and you look at how he participates with defensive marking, how he helps in transition, 
you find out that and actually in many respects he doesn't right the, these critical things that you need him to do he is kind of absent for and so you find yourself with a bit of a, a conundrum because Villardi is not the kind of player who's going to be able to carry both of those guys together. He needs somebody who's going to be more fleet of foot because his game is more, I would say, explosive once he's in the offensive zone. As soon as he's inside that area and you know he receives the puck and he's allowed to kind of cruise along that right side and really open up space there, that's where he's going to be most effective. But he's not the kind of guy who's going to be your lead transition expert. That's where you'd need an Ehlers. And that's why I think you know, that trio of Ehlers, Shifley, and Velarde was so effective is because you had a really good balance of skill sets. Now, I don't want to sit here and, and complain about a win because I'm really not into that. And I think we all know that, like, at the end of the day, most of the team was still pretty good, right? The Jets uh, generally controlled play against Arizona, but you would expect that. I suppose the one thing that you don't love seeing is that there were a number of defensive errors that led to some goals against, you know, Nita Ryder will probably be kicking himself for the one turnover he had behind the back of the net that ended up in a goal against. And um, there was of course the Michelli tip or whatever that no one's going to really enjoy. But, you know, other than that, Arizona wasn't super, super lethal, but it also didn't feel like the Jets had the firmest control at times throughout this game. I think Arizona's speed and scrappiness tended to put the Jets under some serious pressure, which is, again, not great, uh, but it was particularly noticeable with that first line. And I think that continues to be the theme is the first line is a problem. And then you'll see them score an overtime winner like Kyle Connor did again. And you're like, oh, well, they can't be that bad if they're still scoring. But Honestly, they're rocking like a, you know, what, what was it, like a 35% expected goals percentage, which again is one of the worst we've ever seen uh, for any line with the Jets. I honestly, I've, I've wondered if it's even close to, uh, you know, the GST line back in the good old days. But whatever the case is, uh, it, it just really can't be going on for this, uh, for this much longer, right? This trio, something's going to have to change. And what I didn't really enjoy was that bonus was asked about this. And look, I get protecting your guys and, and you know, making sure that you're keeping your top players happy. But he kind of threw the defense under the bus by saying that there are five guys on the ice when it wasn't really the defense that was causing these problems. If your forwards are sucking and really struggling defensively, don't blame your defenders for that. That's not fair. I think he is cognizant of the problems, but it seems like for one reason or another, he doesn't want to change it because he's afraid it's going to impact something else downstream on the roster, whether it's players on their preferred sides or uh, some particular usage in their roles that he doesn't really want to tweak. So I get it, right? I do. And I think Shifley is also going to have input on how he is used and what his role is. But at some point, the Jets are going to have to figure out, you know, can they uh, rearrange these lines? Because I feel like if you make one or two tweaks, you're going to be fine. Things are going to go back to the way they were before, and you can perhaps get Connor a role that's more suitable for his skill set. Because as it is right now, it's just not working. Um, and no matter how many times you keep trying to force it, you're going to continue to see the same struggles on the ice, which is unfortunate because like this trio on the power play is a menace. And with Monaghan now in tow, They've really started to put two and two together, especially as more of the power play is running through Velarde. So, again, I'm not sitting here trying to complain about what can be a good thing at times, but I think we got to be honest and say it's not been enough of a good thing for me to uh, prefer this line over something else. The Jets are going to have to sort it out. They need to figure it out fast because you're going to start playing some quality opponents. And over the next few weeks, we're facing a pretty busy schedule. So the Jets really would do uh, themselves a lot of favors and kind of get themselves back on track here because otherwise the season could get themselves into some trouble and they could slip out of the one of those top seeds uh, in the in the central, which you really don't want to face you know, a Colorado or something in the first round. You want to face a wild card team, not somebody who's been rolling and uh, could honestly put you in a world of hurt in the first round. So a lot to consider, a lot to think about, but I did just mention that the power play has been better. Let's talk about whether or not it's actually fixed, what's changed, what is still a problem. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Before we go any further, though, I did want to shout out our friends and partners at Camino Consulting. Our sponsor, again, is Camino Consulting, and you've heard of their online families and couples course, and you've probably taken advantage of, you know, the locked on 25% discount, which runs all the way through the end of February, but maybe you're interested in a live seminar. In both sport and business, the challenge in differentiating candidates and recruits is an endless battle. Everyone can demonstrate their measurables and qualifications, but what we want to know is, you know, 
what are those intangibles that matter when things are, you know, at the at the the, the absolute limit, right? How do you uh, determine who's really got the stuff and who doesn't? Contact Camino Consulting for your team and management so that you can get a peek behind the curtain and watch your next recruiting class or hiring group become one of the most effective you've ever seen. If you've identified the right candidates and you figured out how to communicate with them better, you're going to be armed with all of the tools you need to uh, really put them on the best track to being successful and executing your vision the way you want. Even if you're not into the sort of stuff and you're not really on the management side, but you're still looking for a way to connect, this is a great opportunity to refer somebody that you know to Camino Consulting. They offer paid referrals, which is fantastic for those of you who know somebody else who might be able to take advantage of their wonderful communication seminars. So contact Camino Consulting at CaminoConsulting.ca and get on the fast track to understanding your clients and your employer employees better. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Everydayers, thank you so much for rejoining us on tonight's episode as we are talking about a couple of critical things. Uh, we just talked about some major takeaways from the game against Arizona, which was, you know, a little bit of a mixed bag overall. You know, the the, the depth lines did exactly what they needed to do, but the, one of the most important lines kind of didn't get the job done as effectively as we'd like. But for the Jets, right, going forward, there's a couple of key uh, issues that they've tried to tackle recently. And one of them has been the power play and the power play has been a little bit of a mixed bag. We know that for sure. You look at the percentages and it's, uh, it's not been pretty if we're being honest, but recently the past few games, there's been a sign of life. I want to talk about what adjustments we've seen and whether it's something that's really sustainable in just a moment. Before we go any further, though, I do want to shout out something really cool the Lockdown Network has done. We have launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and we're now also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV's channels app. Locked on Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with our local experts and our national shows covering every league. Find Locked on Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Now, circling back to the Jets' power play, right? Winnipeg's PP has kind of been... Well, not much of a power play the past few months, but suddenly there's a sign of life. And I suppose the central change has been uh, the introduction of Velarde as a more, I would say, present force, uh, especially on the bumper roll, right? When he's down low and working below the goal line, that is where Velarde really makes his bread and butter. It's really funny because his even strength scoring with that top line struggles has kind of dried up, but his power play scoring has really taken off in a way that I'm not sure any of us really expected. I think a lot of what he does is kind of some of the same stuff that we were begging Pierre-Luc Dubois to do, and it just never really worked out. But this time, we're getting the full measure. We're seeing exactly what Velarde is capable of, and when he's got the puck anywhere near the goal line, he's an absolute menace. It has been hilarious to watch just how good it is, and it's crazy that they didn't do this sooner because the more that you feed through him and have him set up, the more effective this Jets power play is. You actually make Shifley look more like a uh, half-wall threat when you have Velarde kind of keying off on his passes. So that's great because like Shifley otherwise on the half-wall really takes too long in a lot of areas, and I think that's been one of the critical issues is that Shifley, for as creative as a force uh, that he can be, when you use him on the half wall on the, on the power play, it almost adds too much hesitation to his game. When he was in the slot where Monaghan usually occupies uh, nowadays, he was like a one-time god, right? This dude could literally shoot from almost anywhere down, the, down in that slot area and score. But now that he's on the half wall, everything just takes too long. And then you've got Morrissey, who's also not the fastest playmaker at the top point. And then you've got uh, usually, what was it, uh, Ayafalo has kind of occupied the right side. I mean, you've had a couple of different cast uh, of characters. Connor has recently been, you know, trying to one-time it from every angle on that right side. But just generally speaking, the power play has had a lot of issues being too slow. So now that Velarde has kind of simplified some of that stuff and really taken other players out of the equation who are maybe slowing things down, I think it's been a lot more effective once the power play is set up. The problem sometimes gets down to whether or not it actually can set up in the offensive zone because, you know, it can take a while for them to get there. Sometimes they burn up to a minute skating around, dumping the puck, watching it get dumped back out, and then having to reset and chase the puck all over again, which is really not that efficient. It's frustrating to see. We've seen it a lot with this trio at times, uh, or not this trio, but this power play unit. And uh, even with the second power play unit, which is a more direct unit, 
you still see some issues, right? It's not been perfect, but at least recently, now that Velarde has kind of been one of the key uh, creators down low, you've solved at least one of the bigger problems. If this power play can somehow maintain anywhere near this level of performance, it doesn't have to be like 50% necessarily, but just, you know, 25, 30% throughout the next few uh, months, I think that would ease a lot of the stress on the special teams unit because like the PK is still bad. The 5v5 scoring is still a little, a little inconsistent. And until the Jets make a major trade deadline acquisition or anything, we're kind of working with what we've got right now. So the Jets really need to solve this stuff internally, which again, not a problem so long as they're cognizant and aware of what's wrong with it. And, you know, they actually experiment and try new things. I think this switch with Velarde is at least going to solve some issues. It's not going to fix everything, but compared to where we were earlier this year, where the power play just wasn't doing anything whatsoever, I will 100% accept this as a major improvement. So good on the coaching staff for identifying that. It's a very simple tweak, but Maybe that's the, the general message with this team is that some of the changes don't have to be radical. You don't have to like reinvent the wheel with stuff. Just find some simple solutions and maybe just maybe you're going to come away with a big change of performance. That's why I keep saying you swap Ehlers and Connor on those top lines and you might actually notice a big difference. But you know me, I'm not going to keep belaboring that point. I think I've, I think I've yelled about it into a void enough. Uh, obviously the Jets have a, a big game tomorrow because they're going to be taking on the St. Louis Blues and they're going to get a chance to really flex those power play muscles because the Blues recently have been uh, a bit of a tougher opponent than usual. St. Louis, I know, has kind of been considered a bit of a... Uh, a bit of a walk in the park the past couple of seasons, but this year they've given teams more fits than I think a lot of people were expecting. We'll talk about what to expect against St. Louis in just a moment. Before we go any further, though, I did want to shout out our friends and partners at Sleeper. It's almost the halfway point. Uh, obviously, we've just moved past it for the season. And, you know, for uh, for the Jets, it's been an interesting year where there's been some really good moments, perhaps some not so great slumps here and there. But overall, right, the Jets are still firmly in the race for the Central Division title, and you really couldn't ask for more. Well, regardless of where the team is in the current standings, I want to remind you that you could win big by playing Daily Fantasy Hockey on Sleeper, the official Daily Fantasy app of the Locked On NHL Network. Sleeper is our number one choice for daily fantasy sports and especially hockey because with Sleeper, you could win 100 times your cash in daily fantasy hockey contests. For those of you who are big stats nerds and love following the top players, whether it's Picard, McKinnon, McDavid, uh, Mark Shifley, Josh Morrissey, Hellebuck, any of the top players out there that you're a fan of or even maybe hate, but you still at least admire and appreciate their body of work. This is your time to shine because Sleeper has their own projections. And it, if you beat those projections, whether it's more or less than what they're advertising for a given game, you could win. And if you do that with eight correct stats categories for a given game, you could win 100 times your bet with Sleeper. Again, that's 100 times your bet if you correctly choose eight stats category predictions for a given game. So start paying attention and nail your picks so you can start winning big. Use promo code LOCKEDONNHL and you'll get up to a $100 match on your very first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. That's code LOCKEDONNHL. See Sleeper's terms of use for details and locational availability. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets. We are just wrapping up really quickly with some thoughts ahead of Winnipeg's matchup against the St. Louis Blues tomorrow night. Should be a fun game. Should be a more challenging one than I think people were expecting. Uh, the Blues haven't exactly been, like, super consistent recently. They've been up and down. Sometimes they're blowing teams out, like, 7-2. Sometimes they're losing like 4 nothing. It's really hard to get a read on this Blues team, but they're one of those squads that's annoyingly hanging around in the wild card race somehow. Uh, I don't think that they're actually going to make the playoffs, and I would expect them to start considering selling here pretty soon uh, because they're starting to fall behind enough to where even if they were to catch up to, like, say, Nashville, right? Realistically, what are you hoping to accomplish? Uh, since the coaching change with um, Barube out, St. Louis has won quite a few games. They were even on a pretty big winning streak, but then their form's kind of cratered a little bit recently. They're like 500 in their last 10 games. You know, they've they've had some quality wins. I mean, they've beaten, you know, they've beaten the Canucks. They've beaten the Blues. Uh, they've even had some wins against teams like the Oilers. But in between there, you've got losses to the Maple Leafs, to the Preds, even to the, uh, even to the Red Wings recently, as recently as uh, this past Saturday. So they could be a hard team to figure out. I think for the Jets... 
uh, you know, there's a couple of key things that they're going to watch out for. One is Pavel Buchnevich, who continues to really sizzle recently. That line of Buchnevich, Thomas, and Kairou has apparently had some pretty good success, uh, although Thomas was one of the two couple of players who was benched recently uh, after that effort against uh, Detroit. He did not see too many shifts late in that game. They lost 6-1, so uh, hard to really fault the coaching staff for maybe trying to send a message Otherwise, you know, St. Louis really hasn't changed a lot. You're going to see very similar names like Shen, Hayes, Saad, uh, Sungvist, Torpchenko, Walker, Neighbors. You you know these guys. We've seen this team a lot. Uh, there's also some unusual names that I'm not as familiar with, like Zach, Zachary Boluch. Uh, I think uh, that's pronounced correctly. I believe he was a draft pick, but uh, he's joined the team recently. You're going to see Matt Kessel. I think Kessel's played a couple of games before, uh, but then you've got like a mixture of sort of more veteran players like Letty and Krug. Uh, Perunovic, obviously one of those names that for St. Louis was a really big prospect. He's had a nice NHL start to his career, although, you know, in between there's been a few injuries and stuff that's kind of held him back just a little bit, but seemingly on the path to better stuff. And, you know, with with, the, you know, Jordan Bennington and net at times, and then a team that's kind of been a little bit of a frustrating uh, out because they play really low event hockey. This could be a bit of a trap game. Now, all that said, I, I think the Jets should still come away with a big victory. I think the Jets could win this four to two, although I keep saying four to two recently and I keep getting surprised in not the best way. So maybe I should start predicting losses. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if that's me. If I'm the bad luck, maybe I should stop watching games. I don't, I don't really know. Um, but for me, I'm really hoping to see a couple of things from the Jets. The top line really needs to get things going and not give up like 10 billion scoring chances a game. Uh, the power play, I would like to see them continue to sizzle because they've been really good recently. And if Monaghan is, is healthy enough to come back in this game, uh, hopefully he'll have a good outing. He was also starting to find a couple of more even strength points here and there, which is good because I feel like his 5v5 play has been a little bit less than impressive. I mean, he's been okay, but mostly just a passenger more than anything. So seeing him more involved would be good. Uh, at least on the power play, he's, he's, you know, he's really figuring it out. So I can't complain there. Uh, I'd also like to see, you know, some improvement from Pionk. He's had a really rough past couple of weeks. And, you know, the more that he continues to struggle, the more, you know, you start to ask yourself what his long-term future with this team is. Now, you know, I don't like uh, singling out performances from players because it is a team game. Um, but I guess the problem with Pionk's performance lately is that because he's one of the guys that the Jets really lean on, you really need more from him. Um, so the defensive lapses and the so-so offensive production recently are really kind of limiting what he's capable of. And it's a shame because, like, again, I've always said this. There's few players who really leave their heart on the ice quite like Pionk does. That guy is a very fight for the badge player. But we know that, unfortunately, will doesn't always trump skill. Um, and for as much as Pionk really wants to be the guy for the Jets, I feel like it's it's been a struggle for him, especially the past few weeks. Earlier this season, you know, Dylan was able to kind of carry that pairing, and they actually did a pretty good job together. But recently, it's kind of started coming a little bit more unglued. Uh, Pionk has kind of been on the ice for a number of misreads and misplays, that have actually been converted into goals against. So it's unfortunate. It's kind of the nature of the beast. I do hope that he's able to stabilize things because it seems like the team really loves him and I don't expect his usage to really change. Now, if the Jets do make a trade acquisition for a blue liner, I am curious to see how that would impact things because uh, obviously Schmidt's probably going to be the odd one out. But maybe at some point the Jets revisit the idea of whether Pionk is really a lifelong Jet. I don't know. As much as I love Neil, I think we all know that, unfortunately, him getting second-pairing minutes for this team is probably more of an issue than it is a, uh, a help, right? I'd love for him to really turn things around and be a player that the Jets can lean on repeatedly, but but so far it's kind of been hard to say that Winnipeg can really trust him with an elevated role. So a lot for the Jets to stew over. Uh, Winnipeg continues to be discussed as a trade destination for a number of different defenders. We've heard some discussion of Matt Dumba, which I personally would not really be in favor of. Uh, Dumba at this stage of his career is not the, the player that he used to be. And even when he was in his prime years, you'd probably be looking at more like a physical Neil Pionk, right? Somebody who, while he can be gifted with the skating and offensive production, is not really somebody who's as defensively resolute. Maybe he comes to the Jets and their bonus shines again, but I would expect that to not really be the case. 
Uh, it's not often that guys at his stage of his career really turn things around drastically. So in terms of other players, I would really prefer, you know, Walker, of course, is out there. Um, Carrier from uh, the Preds would be nice, but I don't know what the Jets are going to do. Winnipeg has been pretty quiet as to their overall trade deadline plans. All we know is that they're after something, whether it's a top six forward or a depth defender, and that's pretty much the end of the conversation. Chevy is playing it close to the vest. We know that he's going to be cagey about things. He loves doing this and kind of leaving us in suspense to some degree. I just hope that at some point we get a little bit more insight into Winnipeg's process because, you know, we're getting closer to the trade deadline. The Jets are are really in need of a couple of key changes to the roster that could really improve things and get this team at a level to where other teams really start to fear them. I know that the Jets are second in the central, but I don't know if teams yet are, are necessarily afraid of facing the Jets, especially now that they know a couple of key weaknesses with how the Jets defend down low and how you can start to really um, exploit Winnipeg's lack of foot speed. But as it is right now, the Jets are still good enough, and we just have to hope that continues over the next few weeks as things get very busy and very intense. But let me know what you're feeling about for uh, tomorrow's game. Are you excited to see the Jets play the Blues? Do you think Winnipeg will come out with a win? Drop your comments and thoughts below or at my social medias at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. For tonight's episode, though, that is going to be all the time that we have. I thank you so much for making Locked on Jets your first listen of the day every day. Tune in tomorrow for some coverage of Winnipeg versus St. Louis. I'm hoping to get a I'm hoping to get to talk about a win. We will see how that goes. Maybe they just leave Butchnevich here in Winnipeg with the Jets. I don't know. Uh, that would be a heck of a thing, right? Uh, and again, I uh, I saw that per the proposal for Perfetti for Butchnevich. We're not doing that. We can have both. We don't have to lose one of our most talented young players. Uh, although. But the way Bonus keeps using him, maybe we're going to lose him anyways. But thoughts for another day. Like I said, though, for tonight's episode, this is going to be all the time that we have. I thank you so much for making Lockdown Jets your first listen of the day every day. We'll see you right here tomorrow around the same time, so don't go anywhere. Have a great night, and as always, go Jets go.